strategy? Well, I think it, in the sense of changing the life, it's a good question. And uh, it made everybody, I think, in the country aware. I mean, we've, you know, we've gone through world wars and all of that and, and essentially felt quite protected within these borders. And, and I have been quite worried about, Charlie can attest to, you know, the, the possibility, particularly on a, a, of some kind of nuclear uh, device in this country, by t probably more likely by terrorists than by some, some uh, at least declared act of war by a, another state. And 9-11 made everybody realize that, uh, that as humans have not progressed particularly in terms of how they behave with each other over the years, they have progressed in enormously in their ability to inflict damage on those that they hate for one reason or another. And that has increased, you know, for a long time in the world. If you didn't like somebody, the most you could do was throw a rock at them. And that went on for millennia, and then it moved into what you might characterize ironically as more advanced states. And in the last 50 years, it's increased exponentially. And so now people who are megalomaniacs uh, or psychotics uh, or religious fanatics or whatever, and who hate others in some unreasonable way, now have means at their disposal to, to inflict a whole lot more damage, incredibly more damage than they had uh, not too many decades ago. And 9-11 brought that home to everybody, something they probably understood subconsciously and didn't think about very often, to something they thought about uh, much more intensely and it's become much more real to them. Uh, it hasn't really changed my view about, I mean, in the sense that I, uh, you know, I, there are millions and millions and millions of people in the world that hate us, and most of them can't do anything about it. But a few have always tried to do something about it, and now the instruments they can use, uh, and the most extreme, in, in a sense, being the human bombs that have uh, appeared in the Middle East, but the, uh, th there's more ability to, incredibly more ability for the deranged to want to inflict harm to do harm, and that's a reality. Uh, in terms of the business aspects of it, the question, obviously the area at Berkshire that it affects most significantly by miles is, is, is insurance. And prior to 9-11, even though we recognize that there could be huge monetary damages that flowed from the activities of what I would call deranged people. We hadn't really written the contracts in such a way as to either get paid for taking that risk or to exclude the risk. In other words, we were throwing it in for nothing. We had excluded risk for war. I mean, we knew that, I mean, we'd seen what had happened in England and in the 40s, and, and, and so we, we had taken account of something that, that, that some of us had seen with our own eyes, but we didn't take account of something that we knew was possible, uh, but we just hadn't seen. And that's, you know, that's the human condition to some degree. Since September 11th, everybody in the insurance business recognizes that they've had exposures uh, that they weren't charging for, and they either had to exclude those exposures or they had to charge for them. Uh, we have written, first thing we had to do, of course, is we had lots of policies on the books that left us exposed to this, and most of those policies ran for a year, starting at different points. Those have run off to a great degree, but they're not entirely run off. Uh, the other thing we did was on new policies, we have sold a fair amount, quite a, quite a large amount, of terrorism insurance that excludes what we call NCB, nuclear, chemical, and biological, as well as fire following uh, nuclear. Uh, and uh, we can take a fair amount of exposure to that sort of terrorism because it doesn't it won't aggregate. It aggregated at the Twin Towers in, in, in a way that at World Trade Center in a way that just about was about as extreme as you could get for non 
NCB type activities. I mean, that, that was a huge amount of damage done without nuclear, chemical, or biological. But we can have tens of billions of dollars with NCB excluded uh, throughout a greater New York area or something. But we can't have we can't have hundreds of billions of exposure that would be exposed, say, to nuclear activities because uh, they're a an act or two uh, or three coordinated could cause damage that uh, would destroy the insurance industry. And if we had coverage on that, it would destroy us as well. Uh, so we write very little. We do write a little because we can take we can take so we can lose a billion or two billion dollars and and if we got paid appropriately for taking the risk you know that's that's a business we're in but we can't lose 50 or 100 billion dollars and uh so we take a little bit we take a few risks that involve uh nuclear chemical or biological uh but generally speaking the terrorism insurance that we're writing and we've written a fair amount of it excludes those particular risks you can say, you know, take biological, how could that be something uh, significant uh, from an insurance standpoint? Well, many people don't realize it, but the World Trade Center loss was by a huge margin the largest workers' compensation loss in history. You think of it as property damage, but in the end, close to 3,000 people died who uh, were working at the time they died and therefore covered by workers' compensation. If the same thing had happened at Yankee Stadium while they were all watching a baseball game or some other place, they wouldn't have been covered by workers' compensation. So it was happenstance to some degree. But that was became the largest workers' compensation loss in history by a huge margin. Now, if you were trying to cause huge damage in this country and you could figure out something that in the way of a biological agent, and there are people working on this, that would could be injected into the uh, ventilation systems or whatever of large plants, large office buildings. You could create workers' compensation losses that that uh, you know would just totally boggle your mind. And anybody that was working on such a thing, you have to expect they would, if they thought they had perfected it, would try to do something close to simultaneously in, in areas where there would be thousands and thousands of people working and it would it could make the World Trade Center loss look like nothing. So we have to be um, basically vigilant in, 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 in how much risk we let aggregate in something of that sort. Uh, we've People have always been vigilant about how many houses they'll insure along a, a shoreline or, or the, the in terms of physical risk, they, you know, they don't want too many, they don't want too many homes or factories on the San Andreas Fault or something of the sort, because they recognize that as having aggregation possibilities. But now you have to think about things that man may plan in the way of catastrophes that will have aggregation possibilities, and that is something that's pretty much been introduced into the insurance world's thinking since September 11th. Uh, and I can tell you, you know, we think a lot about it. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, the social consequences are far worse than insurance, but we have to think about how we pay our claims. Because if we ever do anything really foolish and endanger, take an aggregation that would cause us to lose the net worth of Berkshire, we would not only not be able to pay the claims of the people in that disaster, but there are other people that suffered injuries 15 years ago, paraplegics and all that, that we're making payments to for the rest of their lifetime, and we wouldn't be able to make those payments, and we're not going to run our business that way. Uh, Charlie? Yeah, to the extent that uh, September 11th has caused us to be less weak, foolish, and sloppy, as we plainly were in facing some plain reality, uh, it's a plus. We regret of course, what happened, but we should not regret at all that we now face reality with more intelligence. This inconvenience that we all have, uh, this tightening of immigration procedures, etc., should have been done years ago. The most important thing in investments is not having a high IQ, thank God. I mean, it, the important thing is, is realism and discipline. And you don't need to be extraordinarily bright to do well in investments if you are realistic and, and disciplined. And the same thing applies in insurance underwriting. It is not some arcane 
science that, you know, that uh, the ability to which to do successfully is given only to a few or which requires the ability to do high. Mathematics have very little to do with it. Uh, as an understanding of probabilities and all that, the kind of a gut understanding that's important. But it does not require the ability to manipulate figures. Uh, it does not really, you know, you, you could do it without calculus. You can do it, you can really do it with a good understanding of arithmetic and a, an inherent sense of probabilities. And as Charlie says, to the extent that I think we've always, from the investment standpoint, you know, if we've had any distinguishing characteristics, it would be that in terms of realism and, and, and discipline. And generally that means defining what you don't know. Uh, in insurance underwriting, it's the same thing. You have to have, you have to be realistic about what you can understand and what you can't understand and therefore what you can insure and what you can't insure. <clears throat> and you have to be disciplined about turning down uh, all kinds of offerings or you're not getting paid appropriately. And, and September 11th drove home those lessons and probably redefined getting it paid appropriately in certain cases.